All right, hello everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about a problem, a position that is in this uh, Agard book, Thinking Inside the Box. And before I blabber a little bit, let me just introduce the position if you want to think along with me. This is white to play and win. And uh, so I'll just introduce it a little bit here. So Kostya got me into this, Kostya Kavutsky here, fellow member of Chess Dojo, got me into this book, Inside the Box. He's pretty, he's way more up to date than I am on like the new chess literature. And I've also been doing, um, trying to improve my calculation. I've had some cool discussions with Mikhailo Oleksienko, who's from the Grabinsky School of Calculation. That being the idea that calculation is the most important thing about chess. I don't necessarily agree with that, but uh, I'm, you know, eager to try new things out and to improve my calculation. Um, so one of the things about this book, Inside the Box, is it starts, I feel, kind of rudely. We begin with this position and dude says, oh man, this one's really hard. Give yourself at least a half an hour and by the way, only one guy ever solved it. Later we learn that it was like, dude solved it with a hint. But like guys like Gelfand had problems with it. Shankland had problems with it. Loads of GMs have looked at this position. And uh, the game, interestingly, I think it was for like Agard's last norm, 2007. Kind of interesting. He got it at the same time as me. Um, and he's playing Rousin. And Rousin, you might know, is a very strong uh, chess author. And so it's a little bit like Battle of the Authors. And um, I'm sure there was more ego going on than just, you know, whatever tournament it was, you know, that's, who's, the, who's the chess author of the day, you know. And I do really, I'll say, uh, Rousin's Seven Deadly Chess Sins is one of the better books out there. And that was written like 20 years ago. Okay, so... One reason I think I was able to solve this problem is just a kind of thinking that I do on, on the regular. I don't think I'm the only one that does this, but um, I like to uh, think about the harmony of the pieces before anything else goes on. By the way, if you want, I'm about to give some hints or just ways of thinking about the position. If you want to think about the problem, I strongly suggest like setting it up on a real board. Not only will that improve your visualization, but it will uh, be more of a spiritual activity when you do so. And um, when you first look at the position, it really seems like white is doing fantastic. In particular, this diagonal looks really juicy. And the pawn on d6 looks wonderful. And the a file looks great. The problem really comes when you start thinking about the other minors. These knights, for example, and the bishop. Not really clear what they're doing. So the method, if you will, of how I solved this problem was really to focus on improving the worst piece. And I think that is a motto, worst piece is in this case, but that is a very basic way of thinking about the game that really can help you, anybody, play very strong chess. And when it comes to these calculation exercises, for example, I'm not you know, I'm sure I'm not up there with the top guys in solving them, either in uh, how fast I solve them or uh, how, you know, cor efficiently and um, correct, obviously. So the first move that comes, I think, to anybody's mind is bishop d5. And that's the move that was, in fact, played in the game. Um, the... It's just natural, and one of the things in a practical game especially is that um, you don't know exactly what the guy's going to do. Maybe he goes C, bishop c6, maybe he plays queen b6, maybe queen b8, and then you kind of figure it out. Uh, but one of the crimes about bishop d5 is that you're playing with your pretty piece right? Your bishop on b3 is by all means the pretty piece. And bishop d5 certainly makes sense because you're worried about some kind of c4 
and then the bishop's going to be shut out from its glorious diagonal. So that all made sense, but I couldn't see anything after any of the moves, nothing concrete anyway. Queen b6, queen b8, bishop c6, I couldn't really see uh, anything fantastic. So, um, of course, I'm sure many of the GMs who looked at this problem, one of their first things, as any type time you have a problem, is they were looking at stuff with knight f5. Uh, that's kind of a standard answer to a lot of problems, and because you're told it's a problem, you're kind of primed to do something like knight f5. Unfortunately, it, I can't see that it does anything. And of course, you could play bishop d5 and then knight f5. To get the other knight moving, you can think about g5, but honestly, you're not even threatening anything at that point. You will then, your mind will then start going like bishop h6, and you're like, well, again, what am I actually doing? So um, the interesting thing, one of the, the path to me solving this problem was that first to realize that the rook would really not like to be on a2, and much rather you would want, say, the queen on a2. So the rook is funny. And let's say the other obvious thing, the queen on b7 is preventing the invasion of the rook. The next obvious thing you say to yourself is, well, the knight on g3, if it's not f5, if it's not f5, then I got to find some other way into the game. And that to me was the key hint, because I think as a defender, one of the things you can say as a defender is if your opponent has a piece that's dominated, like the way the knight on g3 is dominated, you probably have a reasonable chance of saving yourself, even in a bad position. So those factors helped me kind of get to it. And then the next thing is, after spending some time with it, I began to see that black's pieces really want to use these squares, bishop c6 sometimes, sometimes bishop e6. And so that kind of spoke to me, and I was like, oh, at least I have the idea. And then interestingly, one of the funny things about this problem is once you see the idea, the details aren't that hard to figure out. So if you have, if you want more time, hit pause, and you can think about it some more. The answer is bishop f7. Beautiful because it's not the first thing that comes to mind. You, you don't want to take a pin piece, and you don't want to invite the king in. You don't want to um, uh, give up your beautiful bishop for that terrible knight. But here, now we play queen d5, exclaim. He's got to take. And now three things have come to pass. We have now uh, gotten the rook available. The uh, squares are taken. And the knight really has trouble getting out. And so it's in this position that I think uh, chess uh, studies have helped me a lot in uh, getting to an understanding of positions like this, where you learn to dominate the pieces. And so, um, you know, you of course, here you don't necessarily stop. You're just encouraged by the fact that the rook is working and the knight on g3 is working. The bishop is also working because by getting rid of the queen, that c5 pawn is more tender. And the knight on f3 because black really, really wants to play f5, we're keeping that uh, idea in check. And then I think you just need to see a couple things. On king e8, you see that bishop h6 happens, and the knight is trapped. Again, like an endgame study. If king f7, rook a7, right? And if knight e8, rook a7. And so... Honestly, there's not much more to it than that, because if you don't do something, I guess also I was looking at things like bishop b6, but here knight e4 followed by rook a6 seemed way too much to me. Um, you might be able to play rook a6 first, but it just seemed cleaner to play knight e4 first. And so one of the cool things I'll just end with 
is this revelation that uh, I had years ago that's not only made my chess better, but hopefully more interesting, and that is that pawns aren't people, right? These pawns, these double pawns, are doing a great job, but their job is mostly in constricting the opponent's pieces. It's not because they're doubled or whatever. It's they're getting out of the way of our pieces and hurting his pieces. And yes, if he had an infinite amount of time, we could have troubles of our own, you know. But he doesn't. He doesn't. And that's the kind of dynamic play that I associate with the saying, pawns aren't people. Okay, so as you can see, that is a way for the rest of us, right? The people who are not super GMs, I am not a super GM, can sometimes play positional moves that the big guys don't always get. All right, bye-bye.